Back in 1984, I lived in a 130-year-old, 18-room furnished Victorian mansion in the rural part of South Carolina. It was owned by the same family for all those years. But hard times fell on the family and they had to start renting out the place. The house was in disrepair and desperately needed some TLC. For example, there were still animal stores in the basement from the back where they used to keep livestock to slaughter for the family meals. Also, the kitchen looked like it was last renovated in the 1970s. It had yellow linoleum floors and the walls were also painted yellow. The appliances were likewise from that era. It probably hadn't been inspected by the county in many years. To say it was outdated is a massive understatement. It consisted of three floors and a dark, creepy basement and attic. According to the owners, it has a deep and rich history. In fact, I was even told that Thomas Jefferson had slept in the same bed that I was sleeping in. Most of the furniture was from that era. It had a beautiful spiral staircase that led to the bedrooms on the second floor. The bedroom door across the hall from my bedroom had a hinged bar lock on the outside. It also had knots in it that looked like a demonic face. Whenever you walked into that room in the middle of the summer, it felt like an icebox. The windows were painted shut and there were no fans or AC. It was weird as hell. I had a creepy vibe about this room and I wouldn't go in there. One night when I had to go to the bathroom, I stepped out of the bedroom and I heard footsteps behind me. I looked behind me and didn't see anyone. I freaked out and ran towards the bathroom, terrified. At the same time, I heard footsteps running down the stairs from the attic towards me. I made it to the bathroom out of breath. There was no one to come to my aid. After hunkering down for, I don't know how long, I finally worked up the courage to return to my bedroom for some much needed rest. The next day, my girlfriend, Rene, came over to stay with me. She's very sensitive to spiritual vibes and wanted a tour of the house. As I walked her through the place, she pointed out spiritual hotspots in certain areas. The attic, the basement, and the room on the second floor across from my room. She said that the attic was where the servants used to reside and she still could feel their presence. The basement was where the most intense anger came from. The room across from my bedroom was where an old woman had died years ago. One night when she was staying over, she went to the basement to do the laundry. She went to grab the laundry from the dryer and she felt as if someone was watching her. She spun around and saw what looked like angry slaves from the Civil War era. They slowly crept towards her with retribution in their eyes. She panicked and ran upstairs to the bedroom and said to me, I'm done with this place. I'm out of here. I said, what happened? She said, I saw something in the basement. It looked like a shadow, but I can't be positive. It scared the shit out of me. I replied, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not going back down there. If you want the laundry done, you go down there. I said, fine, I will. And I went downstairs. When I got to the basement, I put the laundry in the hamper and started carrying it up the stairs. When I felt something following me behind me up the stairs. I turned around and saw something following me. It was gray and cloudy and getting closer. I ran up the stairs and into the bedroom. Rene asked me if I saw it. I said, yes, I did. Suddenly, we heard a knock at the bedroom door. We froze in terror. We saw a fog-like substance seep under the door. She backed away, screaming. I charged the door and threw it open. There was nothing there. I yelled into the hallway, come and get me, you fucking pussy. Rene exclaimed, what the fuck are you doing? I told her that I was going to stand up to this bullshit. She grabbed a cru crucifix off the wall and took her place by my side. We waited in anxiety-filled anticipation for what was to come next. After waiting for what felt like hours, we went to bed. The next day, I went to the attic to get some things I stashed there when I first moved in. As I climbed the stairs, I heard movement. I paused to listen closer, thinking it was probably a raccoon or some other small animal but it sounded like someone walking around, almost pacing back and forth. I crept up the creaking steps to the attic door and listened. I could hear them talking, but it wasn't English. It was almost mumbling, but I could tell it was a different language. I reached for the doorknob and it was ice cold. 
Abruptly, the doorknob turned on its own and flew open so hard, it smashed into the wall. My natural reaction was to get into a defensive posture. I was ready to kick the intruder's ass. I looked around the huge multi-roomed loft. Dust was flying everywhere. It was obvious that no one other than me had been up there in a while. Several pieces of furniture from a bygone era were covered in sheets. I located the boxes I was looking for, but they had been moved from where I had last put them. The dust on the floor showed that they'd been slid to a different position. I looked under the sheets just to make sure there were no trespassers hidden under them. I found no one. Also, there were footprints in the dust, human or animal. I scratched my head in bewilderment but shrugged it off. I grabbed my things and went back downstairs. I asked Renee if she had been in the attic. She said no. I told her what had happened and she got a little freaked out. At that point, she stated that the house is haunted. She asked me if I knew the history of the house. I said, I didn't think about it until now. I definitely have to ask the landlord about it when I deliver the next rent check. Later on, while we were watching Amazing Race in the living room, we heard some noises on the floor above us. It was the pitter-patter of little feet scampering back and forth. We looked at each other in horrified wonder. I jumped up and bounded up the stairs two steps at a time. When I reached the landing, I saw small wet footprints going up and down the hallway like that of a child. I tracked the footsteps back to the bathroom. When I got there, the water was running in the clawfoot tub. When I reached to turn the water off, I saw a small boy laying in the bottom of the tub, submerged in the water. His eyes were open, but staring up blankly. He was blue and badly bloated. I screamed, holy shit! I stumbled backward and ran into the sink in horror, knocking several things to the floor. Renee heard the commotion and ran upstairs. When she got there, she asked, what the hell happened? Are you okay? All I could do was point to the bathtub with a shocked look on my face. She looked and saw the boy. Renee said she saw the boy on her initial tour of the house. Thinking he was just a boy, she didn't say anything about him. She turned off the water, drained the tub, and the boy disappeared. As we made our way down the hallway back to the living room, the demonic looking door across from our bedroom flew open with a crash. Startled, we ran towards the room. When we got to the doorway, there was a cold wind whipping around the room like a tornado. Furniture was getting thrown everywhere. In the middle of the room was an apparition of an old cackling hag. She was levitating and reaching out her long talon-like hands towards us. Unexpectedly, the door slammed in our face. We, lo we looked at each other in utter horror. We simultaneously said nope and ran to the car, fearing for our lives. I immediately drove to the landlord's house to break the lease. When I explained why, he didn't act surprised and told me that he'd always had a hard time keeping tenants longer than a month. I asked what the story was about the place. The landlord went on to say, with the house being so old, there have been many deaths inside it. He said the actual number is unknown, but there seem to be four main areas that the spirits inhabit. The basement was where slaves from the Civil War were imprisoned beaten and starved to death. In the attic, a chambermaid had died giving birth as a result of an unwanted pregnancy. In the bathroom, a boy had drowned after slipping in the tub and banging his head. And in the demonic door bedroom, a crazy grandmother was locked in the room because the family thought she was possessed. When a priest was brought in to do an exorcism, they went sideways and she died as a result. I asked the landlord why he didn't tell me about this in the first place. He said if I did, would you sign the lease? I said, of course not. He had no issue with giving me my security deposit back, but kept the last month's rent I paid up front. He said it's going to take at least that long to get someone else to move in. From now on, I know there are going to be certain questions I ask every landlord before I sign a lease. Not so long ago, I waited tables at one of the oldest restaurants in LA. It's called Tamo Shanta. Look it up if you don't believe me. It's one of those old historical gems that even most LA people don't know about. 
Hell, I grew up just a few miles from the place and always called it that log cabin restaurant. It was one of Walt Disney's favourite haunts before Disney was a thing, and it was frequented by the actors of the 1920s and 30s. Well, when I got hired, the first stories I ever heard about were the ghosts of Tam. Tam O'Shanter is a huge restaurant in Atwater Village slash Los Feliz, and from the outside, it looks like a quaint cottage. The inside is large and expansive, with a huge pub and bar in front, and three different rooms in the back. It's rumoured that it was once connected to a drugstore that burned down in a fire and several people were killed. Then there is also a massive kitchen, a wine cellar down a dark hall, and an upstairs with a male and female locker room, and an office and storage room. The place is massive, sprawling, and quite honestly, it's both as warm and inviting as it is creepy and sinister. The story is about the whispers. It wasn't long into training when I started hearing about the alleged ghost stories. A young blonde boy that would come out and run late at night in the large and expansive room farthest at the back. About the woman in black that would walk the hall upstairs late at night and the cleaning crew that would quit no explanation. About the pots and pans that would sometimes shake on their own. About the people who had died in the restaurant throughout its 100 years run. About the salt and pepper shakers that would mysteriously turn the tops of themselves off. About the chandeliers that would move and about the sandwich carver who had been working there for decades and refused to go back to the dining room. And there was more. A lot more. While I've had some experiences with other odd things, dreams and intuition, I've never had any experience in the paranormal. I never really was big on the idea of ghosts I still think most otherly things can be explained, but I must say my time at TAM, especially that first month, made me stop and reconsider my belief in the supernatural. This is the first part in a series of multiple incidences that happened to me. The funny thing is, is the bulk of it happened to me in that first month and seemingly dropped off after a night of closing, after I vowed I would quit the TAM if anything else crazy happened to me. For me, it started with the whispers. I'd be working in the pub and I would hear someone call out to me, Jackson. I suppose whisper isn't the right word. No, it was more like someone calling my name to get my attention. Jackson. The voice was nondescript and neutral. It sounded male of that much I was sure. Like a nondescript white and male voice. Jackson. I would spin around and say yeah to a table a few feet away. They would look at me funny and say, we didn't call you, and politely smile. I think the first couple of days, I just chalked it up to me just hearing things in the noise of the pub. But it started happening more and more often. I'm talking once each hour or every other hour. Jackson. Always just once. And I would turn around and either look around or respond to tables that had never called me. Then I thought maybe the stress of work was making me hear things. Until one day, a co-worker of mine, Ashley, said, I keep hearing someone call my name. And then another of mine, Brooke. And then another of mine and good friend, Dominic. What we all had in common is that we were all new. Dominic started a couple months before. Ashley, a week or two before. And Brooke and I started the same week together. Some of the other staff swore by other more peculiar things, while others witnessed nothing. Well, by the second or third week at TAM, things started ramping up with me. It was now once or twice an hour. Every hour. I ignored it. Thought maybe it was a new medication. Well, one day, early in the morning, I was an opener. Part of my job was to get silverware and make roll-ups for the lighter and more casual style of dining in the pub. I walked to the back near the dishwasher to retrieve the silverware. Suddenly, and right into my right ear, the voice said, Jackson! The same type of way I've been hearing it for the last couple of weeks, except this time it was right next to my ear. I spun around to say what the fuck to the person I imagined would be there to startle me, except there wasn't anyone. It's not like the kitchen was empty, it wasn't, but there was no one in the back part next to the dishwashing pit. I walked a few meters to my left and right, thinking I would catch the person playing a trick on me. No one. So I still didn't really think anything of it and thought it was just one of the buses or runners playing a trick on me. I gathered up the utensils, made my roll-ups and began to think about what had happened more. 
I was beginning to question my sanity. I start to hear voices. I wanted to ask other people about the voices all the time, but I also didn't want them to think the new guy was crazy either. So I happened upon Michelle, who was a sales manager for the company. She was always sweet and bubbly, but she didn't interact as much with the servers because she was mostly in the office. I thought asking Michelle would be a safer bet. Hey Michelle, I have a question for you and it might sound weird. Yeah, what is it? She replied. With hesitation in a soft tone, I asked her, do you ever hear voices in here? She gave out this soft laugh without an inclination of fear. Her laughter made me laugh and sobered me up a little. How ridiculous I must have sounded. How it sounded so crazy she was laughing about it. It's what she said and did next that made me stop laughing. You know, it's so funny you say that. I've heard someone calling my name before. And you know what's so funny? It happened to me right there. My heart sank and my smile evaporated as she pointed. Yeah, it happened right there. What Michelle didn't know is that she was pointing in the same exact spot I had been standing when I heard them say my name. Literally at the same fucking spot. I wish I could say this is all that happened. Unfortunately, there's more. Tamo Shanta is one of the oldest restaurants in LA. The funny thing is most people, even from the city, have never heard of it. Even though most people know its sister restaurants, Larry's Steakhouse in Beverly Hills. Tamo Shanta preceded Laurie's by several decades. Oh and yes, if you're wondering if there's any relationship between Laurie's and Laurie's seasoning salt that most Americans have come to know, there is. The same family that created Laurie's seasoning salt started their business with Tamo Shanta. Because Tam O'Shanta was a favourite of the late Walt Disney, we would get many enthusiastic fans and tours. Yes, tours of the restaurant. I never knew Disney and Walt Disney fans existed until I started working there. In any event, as I stated in the previous post, I never thought so much about the paranormal. I mean, I had had dreams and maybe what could be considered ESP episodes as a child, but never anything having to do with ghosts. I'd like to think I'm a pretty rational person. While I love a good ghost story, I've always thought most stories can be explained. But after my time at Tam O'Shanta, I'm not sure anymore. For a while, I thought I was crazy or perhaps it was a medication, but now I just don't know anymore. In my last post, I talked about the whispers that plagued me almost immediately after I started. They weren't really whispers, and it was always the same male and nondescript voice. Well, I wish I could say the voice was the only thing that happened to me, but it wasn't. One weekday morning, I was scheduled to open for lunch. Arrival, 10.30am. It's not like the place is empty at that time, it's not. But there's only a fraction of the staff there at the time versus the dinner shift, and there's only one server on the floor. To create a mental picture of Tam O'Shanta, it consists of a front entrance that spills into the pub. The pub looks and feels like an English pub, with tables and a few co cosy booths for seating. If you walk further towards the back, you come to the main dining room with about 10 tables. Look to the left, and there's a nook with about 10 tables or so. That's the tartan room. If you look to your right, there's another room with another maybe 15 tables or so. If you walk further, you encounter a small service bar to your right and then six or seven steps leading up to a huge back dining room called the Prince Charlie Room. There's got to be at least another 20 tables there. The Prince Charlie Room was only open on weekends and holidays, and well, the whole month of December as this was, the busiest time for the restaurant. Now that I've laid out a picture, let me get back to the opening shift. My job as an opening server was to make roll-ups for the pub, which got quite chaotic and busy for about an hour for lunch each day. Well, to make roll-ups, you need silverware. Sometimes there wouldn't be any in the dish pits, and so I would raid the polished silverware in the Prince Charlie room. That particular morning, it must have been my third week at the TAM, and by then, I knew if there wasn't any silverware in the dish pits, I should go to the Prince Charlie room. There was always something about that room that didn't quite feel right. It could be noon and 80 degrees, and yet that room still felt dark and cold. It didn't help that the only windows were at the back of the room. 
There were also these old paintings of some famous Scottish poets and young princes that adorned the room. I don't know, but I always found them creepy, especially the picture of a young toddlerish boy. It didn't help that a few decades ago, employees swore that they would see a young blonde toddler run across the room late at night. One employee who had been there over 20 years flat out refused to enter that room, regardless of the time of day. He hadn't gone up there and in there in years. Well, that particular day, I needed silverware. There was none and I was new and needed to make roll-ups. I'd already been dealing with the voices, or the voice that continued to call out my name during service, but I had chalked that up to medication. So when I approached the Prince Charlie room that morning, I didn't think much of it. Well, I made it up to the couple of steps just fine. But by the third step, it was like, I don't know, something was draining me. To this day, I can't really describe it. It was like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. I got to the fourth stair and suddenly, and I mean suddenly, it felt like my life force was being drained. Oh my God, I know that sounds crazy, but that's the only freaking way I can describe it. It literally felt like someone or something was taking my energy, my being, everything away from me. I made it to the fifth stair, but felt dizzy, tired, so tired, perhaps something like sunstroke. But I just didn't feel tired. I felt confused. Like maybe I was having a stroke. I tried for the second to last step, but couldn't make it. I became disoriented, dizzy and exhausted at the same time. Fuck, I felt like I was dying. Or at least what I imagined dying must feel like. I immediately stopped and retreated down the stairs. I made it to a chair at a nearby table and sat down. Things were starting to spin and I was so tired. I think I sat there for about a minute. I'd started a new medication a few weeks ago and told myself it must be the medication. Yeah, I heard the voices for a couple of weeks now, but I too chalked that to the medication. I approached the stairs and this time I tried again. Slowly, I made it up to the room. I hurriedly grabbed the silverware, looked around the creepy looking and overly dark room, even in the daylight, and bolted down the steps again. I wish I could say this only happened once. It didn't. It's only been a few years, but my sense of time is a little messed up. I don't know if this second incident happened a few days later or a couple of weeks later, but I'm certain it happened in the first couple of months working there. One afternoon, after the above experience happened, I was working in the pub. Yes, I was still hearing voices, but there were always plenty of people around, so it never really scared me. Well, this particular afternoon, I had just started my shift and I was near the service well of the bar. If anyone doesn't know what a service well is, it's where the bartender makes the drinks for tables of a restaurant. The server then takes the drinks from the well and brings them to a table. That particular day, Narina was working in the service well. I can't remember, but I'm certain there was another server there as well. We were all chatting about something or other when all of a sudden, I felt the same weakness and dizziness I had experienced the morning I had gone to the Prince Charlie room for silverware. Again, I had never mentioned to anyone at this point about my experience on the steps, so when the same feeling came over me, I ignored it. That was until Narina said something that shocked me. Out of nowhere she blurted, I feel dizzy all of a sudden. Now, I can't remember if she said dizzy or weird, but I swear on my mother's dead grave she said something to that effect. Enough for it to elicit an adamant and eager, me too. No one knows how relieved I felt at that moment. For weeks, I thought I was going crazy. Losing my mind is crazy. Hearing my name all the time, draining of my energy. I thought I was going batshit. The problem is, if you ask Narina about this incident, she has no recollection of it. She doesn't ever remember saying that, and she doesn't ever remember feeling dizzy, or like her energy was being drained or like something really wrong was happening at that moment. By God though, I remember it. Clear as fucking day. I remember being so happy that I wasn't the only person who felt that invisible force draining something away. Something away from me. But Narina doesn't remember this. She didn't remember this when I talked about it a few months later, and she doesn't remember it today. I often ask myself what the fuck I remember. I never had any paranormal experiences before I started working at Goldall, Tano Shanta, 
and I was already in my 30s, so I didn't understand anything that was happening to me. The year was 2000. I and my two sons, then eight and one year old, had moved into a newly renovated apartment. The building was a row of four townhouse apartments, and I was between two empty units, with the only other occupied unit being on the end. My husband was away from home for a few weeks. We lived in Okinawa for six years, but only spent two of them in this house. It was around 1am on our first night in the new apartment, and I was in the kitchen decorating and putting things away. Completely quiet, no radio or TV on. Kids had been asleep for a few hours. The kitchen was an L shape. I was standing at the sink and window, which faced the front of the building. Behind me by several feet was a swinging door to the dining room. To my left by several feet was a swinging door to the entryway slash stairs to the bedrooms. It was from that side door that I heard a voice, a child. Mommy? If you've ever heard a child wake up disoriented from a bad dream, or a child about to be ill, it was that level of distress. Just a single word, right outside the door to the kitchen. Mommy? Naturally, I assumed it was my eight-year-old, so I called his name and opened the door. No one there. As I was standing there assessing, mere seconds ticked by and I heard it again. Only this time, from the landing at the top of the stairs. Mommy? I was mildly disturbed at this point, but I called his name again and went upstairs. I looked in both their rooms. Both kids were sound asleep, doors still closed. Now I was definitely disturbed, but I somehow managed to go back to the kitchen and finish what I was doing. A month later, my mother was visiting from, from the States. One night, she was upstairs using the bathroom and came downstairs to ask me why I had called her. I hadn't mentioned the voice yet. I told her all about it. The next night, she was sleeping in the sofa bed in the living room. My eight-year-old was with her. She woke up in the middle of the night, gasping for breath, followed by a coughing fit, which had been a frequent thing for her, and eventually felt a hand patting and rubbing her back. When she stopped coughing, she turned to thank the eight-year-old. He was sound asleep, on his side facing away from her. Fast forward a couple of weeks. My husband decided to give me a break one morning and got up with the one-year-old. After I got up, he told me about some strange things that happened. He had put the toddler in the high chair and gave him part of a banana, putting the rest of it, still in the peel, well out of reach. He left the room for a minute, came back, and the child had the rest of the banana. Peel empty where my husband had left it. No way he could have gotten it himself. Husband left the room again and rushed back when the stereo, which had been on very low, suddenly turned to max volume. How I slept through that, I have no idea. When he went to turn it down, he saw something odd in the corner of the room, which, strangely, he already couldn't remember when he was relaying this all to me. It was blank in his mind. He's super skeptical of everything, and I think he intentionally blocked whatever or whoever it was he saw there. Every year, we would get two or three typhoons. During one typhoon in 2001, after several hours, the eye of the storm was perfectly over of us. When this would happen, my husband and I would go outside and enjoy the fresh air, assess the area, talk with the neighbours, etc., before the storm returned to blow in the opposite direction. In the eye of a typhoon, things are super calm and quiet. We were right outside the open front door of the porch, and the kids were upstairs. And out of nowhere, this horrible scream pierces the air in the staircase. Think like horror film. Woman being murdered in the shower kind of scream. The kind that echoes and sends chills down the spine. It didn't sound like a kid at all, but my first thought was my son's. Husband and I yanked open the screen door, and I called out the kids in a panic, right as they both ran to the top of the stairs. Both completely freaked out. Talking to my oldest now, almost 30, he describes hearing the scream of a woman and thinking I had been seriously hurt. Talking to my oldest son in recent years, he's recounted to me things he experienced in that house that he never mentioned when we were living there. He experienced things often, but there are two stories in particular that stand out to him. The first, 
He went to bed one night and turned on his radio. It was set to full blast, something he didn't do. He turned it off quickly and then heard a man in the hallways bang violently on his bedroom door while yelling, hey. My son called out an apology and then came downstairs to get some water and noticed that my husband and I were both on the couch watching TV. He knew it wasn't his dad that had banged on the door. Second, my son had gone to bed and was laying there for a few minutes, not sleeping, when something made him open his eyes and look at the foot of his bed. Kneeling at the foot of his bed and seemingly playing with a toy or something on the edge of the bed was a girl. She was facing him but looking down at what was in her hands. Behind her and slightly to the side was a boy with his back turned, seemingly touching my son's DVDs on the bookcase. He said they looked to be about his age and kind of blue and dark, like a poorly lit hologram. He kept staring, thinking that when his eyes adjusted, they would disappear, just part of his imagination. He said maybe 20 or 30 seconds went by and they both looked at him at the same time. The boy turning and the girl looking up, locking eyes with him. He said the expressions on their faces seemed like they were not happy they'd been seen. They completely froze like that and slowly faded away. When the fade was complete, his DVDs fell off the shelf. When he got up the next morning, the DVDs were on the floor and he knew he hadn't imagined it. We kept in touch with two out of three neighbours in that building and we talked about the place years later. They all experienced things involving kids' voices, pranks played, cabinet doors opened, etc. But the one that really sticks out, one neighbour's eight-year-old son was tentatively diagnosed with schizophrenia. He'd been hearing the voices of children outside his bedroom door, demanding that he play with them or they would hurt his baby brother. So they sent the family back to the States where he could get adequate services. Thing is, when they left Okinawa in that apartment, the voices stopped entirely. No drugs required. Diagnosis revoked. We've been back to the States 20 years now and have never experienced anything like it before or since. My son and I have developed a head cannon around this place that a US soldier had killed his family and then himself. When my son was age three, we moved to a new flat and about a year after being there, I would have a feeling my son was behind me and wouldn't be. And out the corner of my eye, I'd see what looked like my son and go to talk to him. And he wasn't there and in his room playing. This happened every now and again, and I never thought too much about it. But when my son was six, I would hear him not just playing toys with himself, but asking questions and answering someone. One time he was having a full-blown conversation in the bathroom whilst brushing his teeth. So I said to him, who are you talking to? And he said, Tommy. So I asked him who Tommy was, and he said, my friend, mummy. I said, okay, so what does he look like? And he answered, just like me. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if this is who I've been seeing on and off for a few years. So I asked, is Tommy a ghost? He looked horrified and said, no. So I spoke to my mum about it, and she said, well, he would think of a ghost being scary. Ask him if Tommy is a spirit. I thought, well, he doesn't know what that means, but I'll try. So one afternoon I said to him, is Tommy a spirit? And his mouth dropped open and he said, how did you know that, mummy? And I didn't want to say too much as I didn't want to put ideas in his head. So I said, I'm just guessing, why do you know he is? So he started telling me how one day, Tommy sat in his bed and said, don't be scared, Jack, but I'm a spirit. And my son looked at me and said, but mummy, I wasn't scared as I don't know what a spirit is. So I said, well, you're very lucky, as not everyone can see them as a spirit as someone who died. And he said, oh, wow, well, Tommy's back alive again. So not to scare him, I left it there. That night I was watching TV and heard Jack running down the hallway and his face looked around the doorframe at me. So I said, Jack, why are you up? And he vanished. I got up and Jack was fast asleep. I then went on holiday for a week without his dad as he was working. We went to a caravan and my nieces were asking Jack if Tommy had come. And he said, no, he said he was staying behind to watch daddy. So I didn't think much about that. We got home and my husband was behaving strangely, causing arguments and always walking out for hours. 
and I kept feeling Tommy and I were speaking with my mum and said how my husband had changed and Tommy seemed angry. My mum said to try and connect, but I never did try. It was a Saturday morning in August and I had my cousin's wedding to go to and my husband was Usher. I woke early to an eerie feeling and then a noise that something had dropped. I looked out in the hallway and Jack's door sign was halfway down the hallway and standing upright. No one could have done that as Jack had stayed at my mum's. At the wedding, I called my husband on the phone to an unknown number. We had a huge argument and he ended it there and then. I was heartbroken. I never felt Tommy at home again and Jack said he was gone. I felt so sad for Jack as he was upset about his dad leaving also. It also came out that my husband had brought this girl back to our flat while I was on holiday. So it made sense why he was watching his dad. And also why I felt Tommy was angry when I got home. I went to see a medium who told me that my son had a friend called Thomas. That sent shivers down my spine as obviously Jack said Tommy. She described what he looked like and again I went cold as she just described my son. I asked why he isn't around now and her answer was he was there to protect Jack. But all I could think was why did he leave when he was upset then? So when my son was 14, I had a conversation with him and said, do you remember Tommy? He said yes and described the clothes I used to see him in. And he said, Tommy would come and sit with me when dad was really shouting and scared me. He would make me feel safe. And then all these years later, what that lady said made sense. He didn't need to protect Jack once he left as Jack was no longer scared of his dad's temper. So after telling my last story about my son's not so imaginary friend, I thought I'd share another of my stories. As I said, I've always had spiritual experiences since I was a baby. My mum said I'd watch things that weren't really there and ask where it went. So I always found it awkward telling many things I see and hear, or dream things that are real for others. I'd started to date my ex who I married, and I went to stay at his house. I walked in and straight away felt a very gloomy presence but said nothing. I was there for three nights, so I tried not to let it bother me. I went to use his upstairs bathroom and they had this big mirror in there. I felt scared. I didn't know why, but the mirror made me feel eerie and so cold. I was scared to look into it as I just felt like something was going to appear or jump at me. I never told him this as though he would think I was crazy. I had a shower in there and the whole time felt incredibly uncomfortable. The shower suddenly felt so hot, and when I got out, I had these three big scratches up my bottom half of my leg. I had no idea how it happened. Once the weekend was over, I went home and didn't think much about it. I went back there a couple weeks later, and suddenly felt that presence again. Again when using the bathroom, I felt scared, but nothing too much happened that weekend. Another two weeks later, I stayed again. I had a really vivid dream that he had to wake me from as I was crying. But in this dream was a man on a motorcycle and was hit by a white bus. When he woke me, I thought I had to say about this dream as that could be dusted off as just a dream, nothing to look crazy about. So I told him what happened and he looked shocked and said that's exactly how his dad had died. So then he asked how I would dream of something like that and I had to explain all my life I've been like this. He accepted it quite well, and he asked if I ever felt anything in the house, so I said yes, and wasn't too nice, and his bathroom mirror especially scared me. Again he was shocked, and said his brother saw what he described as a figure of death jump out at him from the mirror when he was looking into it getting ready. A black cloaked figure, he said. I hadn't seen that, but obviously I wouldn't look in the mirror. After we had spoken about it all, I went to the shower and the shower went hot again and once again, three scratches down my leg. That night I was laying on his lap looking over him, talking and laughing when a massive dark shadow figure went right above me. I jumped and closed my eyes. I could hear my ex's voice saying my name to get me to open my eyes. When I did, he was looking around and wasn't sure why I'd put my arms over my head to protect myself and legs up towards my chest. He laughed and said there was a spider as I knew he knew I was scared of them. 
so I told him there was a horrible dark shadow figure right above me. He told me how he had heard stories about the people who lived there before. Apparently devil worshippers and did Ouija boards and weird stuff. Before I met him, he had terrible depression and didn't leave the house. And I just felt it didn't like me there as he was no longer as depressed and gaining confidence. I didn't stay there much after that as he started to visit me and moved in together. But that house was awful. They moved when his dad died. He grew up majorly depressed. His brother ended up dying at the age of 30. His mum was still there and so depressed, she no longer leaves the house. I have no idea about the history, but so glad I never have to visit again. My children never have to either. This was 30 years ago. It will never be forgotten. I was sleeping over at my friend's house. He was on his bed, I was on the floor. His room is at the end of the hall upstairs. Right next to his bedroom door is the door to his mom's room, the master room with bathroom. On the other side of the hall is the door to the bathroom. Down the hall near the top of the stairs is his sister's room, nothing else upstairs. The distance from the top of the stairs to my friend's bedroom is maybe 15 feet, not very far. Okay, so we're laying down to go to sleep. His mom has already gone to bed with their two giant poodles. They slept in her bed every night. His sister is out of state at college and there's no one else in the house. Parents divorced. So we're finally getting quiet and not talking and it's quiet. And I hear someone walk up the stairs and walk down the hall to the area right in the crimp of our door. His mom's door and the bathroom door and then nothing else. I thought it was just an old house thing because this was an old Victorian house with hardwood floors throughout. No biggie. Kind of getting sleepy. I hear it again. The same exact thing. So now I'm like, what the fuck? So now I'm laying there on my side, head tilted to watch the door and listening. I'm wide awake. It happens again. Then a few minutes later again. I'm like, what the actual fuck? So I'm kind of freaking out. And I turn my head to look at my friend in his bed who I thought was asleep. And he's looking at the door and then looks at me with that what the fuck look. So we both quietly get up and stand up closer to the door. It happens again. We booked each other. We wait, hold our breath basically. A couple minutes later, it happens again and we both reach for the door as the steps come to the area right outside his door. And he wax wings the door open. Nothing. Nothing there at all and the house is quiet. We step out and look in his mom's room. She has the door open. Both dogs and mom passed out to sleep in her bed. In fact, one of the dogs lifted his head, looked at us, then laid his head back down. We walked over to his sister's room. Nope, she's not there. Bed is made, no one there. We kind of stand there for a minute and whisper to each other things like, what the hell? Those were steps, right? Footsteps? Yes, yes. House is still quiet, so we go back to his room. Sit there chatting for a while and just kind of freaked out. Then we settle in to go to sleep again, because it's getting late now. As soon as we get quiet and start to settle, footsteps again. This time my buddy leaps out of bed, grabs the doorknob and flings the door open. Nothing. But this time, we were loud, so mom woke up. She's like, what's that noise that's going on? We just told her not to go back to sleep, and we went back to his room. We sit there and just kind of talk to each other about what we're feeling and what happened talking quietly and it keeps happening every few minutes. We stop talking and listen till it stops, then go back to whispering. It got to the point where we were laughing or giggling quietly because it was ridiculous. I mean, it was shoes on footsteps, like dress shoes or boots, loud and the wood creaking along with the steps as they came down the hall. I spent many nights in that house in that room and this didn't happen every time, but it did happen often. So often, we got used to it and just slept. Same house at some point, hanging out in the backyard with my buddy and couple friends drinking wine coolers or some shit. His mom wasn't home, sister was at school, and we were out on the deck in the middle of the day, maybe 3pm. I glance up at the second story window as I'm taking a swig of my wine cooler, and I see a woman in his mom's bedroom window. I did a double take and she wasn't there. I look at my bro and he's looking at me. 
I was like, you saw that? He says, yeah. I saw something move. I looked up and saw nothing. Maybe a woman. So we literally jumped up, ran in and ran upstairs and searched. Nothing. No one. Same house. My bro's mom was down in the basement. We were upstairs in the kitchen. She was getting food out of the freezer down there to cook dinner for us. She's only gone a couple minutes and we hear her scream. We ran down there and she was on the floor in front of the line, looking around and clearly scared. She sees us and she says, who else is here? We look at each other and we're like, what the fuck, no one. It's just us and you screamed. She's freaking out. We all go to the kitchen and after she settles down and is making dinner, she tells us she was kind of bent over looking in the lower part of the fridge for something and she clearly felt two hands on her back push her into the fridge. Same house, as a kid, my bro was being chased by his sister through the house around the dining room table and tripped and fell head first through a big mirror on a big credenza type thing. His head is through the thing completely. The mirror has broken clean above his neck. The stud below shattered. The part above is just hanging there, in the wood like it should I guess. But it's a big mirror, as tall or taller than an adult. Mum is freaking out. She pulls him out and the second his head comes out, that giant piece of mirror slides down like a guillotine and shatters. Like a split second from decapitating my bro. A couple occurrences with this now, but the first interaction I had with her was when I was maybe 9 or 10. I lived with my grandma during this time, with my mom, since we were going through a hard move and it was really stressful and complicated. My grandma lived in an old folks home sort of, but not a nursing home, just a place where a bunch of elderly people lived. Anyways, my mom and I slept out in the living room on couches, and I remember one night that I was laying down trying to sleep, but I couldn't. I remember sitting up slightly and then seeing a smiling old woman, dead ass, maybe nine feet away from me. The weird thing was that only I found her head. There was no body. It was just her creepy, smiling face. I don't know if it was sleep paralysis or I was just scared shitless, but all I did was stare for a while before I yelled for my mom and she woke up. Of course, she saw nothing and I remember it was gone after, but I was still strongly weirded out. I talked to my mom and grandma in the morning and they blamed on it being a nightmare. Fast forward a couple years later, I'm living somewhere new. I'm about 11 or 12. Basically, the same situation happens and this time she's standing closer but against my closet and it's still her smiling old face. This time, I turned over and went to bed and forced myself to sleep but I distinctly remember it being the same face. I'll never forget the night of August 14th, 2021. I was fishing the river with my friend in a suburb of Minneapolis slash St. Paul, Minnesota. We love coming to this public park to fish because it was quiet and there was a nice sandbar to fish from. This park had a Sioux burial mound about a half a mile from our spot. After fishing for a better part of the day, we decided to leave at dusk. In order to get back to our vehicles, we had to take a trail through the woods, which was about a five minute walk. I put a clip light on the bill of my hat so we could see the trail. I remember when I first glanced ahead down the trail, I saw two circular white lights that I assumed were fireflies. Once we got further down the trail, we were closer to the area where I had seen the fireflies. It was then that I saw a pair of eyes that were either highly reflective from my lights or glowing white. It wasn't long before I could make out a body. It was a very large white body on four legs, bigger than a wolf, but unnaturally skinny. I couldn't make out any facial features because its eyes were so bright. I wanted to warn my friend, but all I could manage to say was, there's something there. We had no choice to proceed because this was the only way back to our vehicles. This thing just stared us down, but didn't make a sound. My friend yelled at it to try and scare it away, but it didn't react at all. I yelled at it after she did and it responded back mimicking my voice. 
I honestly questioned myself and thought I was imagining things. So I yelled at it again and it responded back at the same volume, same pitch, exactly like my voice. At this point, we realized that this was not an animal. We both continued on the path in silence, but I maintained eye contact with the creature. I felt like this thing was ready to attack us at any moment, but it just stood there staring. Eventually, we were out of the woods and I could no longer see its eyes. We made it back to our vehicles and felt a sense of relief. I asked my friend, did you hear that talk back to me? She said she did, and it sounded like my voice when it responded back to us. If she hadn't heard the voice, I would have assumed I imagined it. We went over what happened and our stories were the same, except she said the creature had a wolf-like head. After our experience, my friend who is Hmong went to see a shaman. The shaman believed it was an evil spirit and performed a cleansing on her. She was still shaken up by the experience for several weeks. I tried to hire a spiritual advisor online, but when I described the experience and asked for a spiritual cleansing of my own, it said they were not available at this time. At the advice of one of my friends, I burned some tobacco and said a prayer that the entity would leave me alone. It took me several months to just feel normal again, but I still think about it on a weekly basis. I tried to do further research and contacted the management at the park. They said the park we went to had ancient Indian remains scattered along the river that were unmarked. They said that there were more Indian remains in that park than any other parks they managed. I contacted several Native American friends and was told the entity we encountered was a skinwalker. I know skinwalkers are part of the Navajo culture, but from what I read, it checks more of the boxes more than any other supernatural being or cryptid. Around three years ago, I was an engineering student at the University of Central Florida. I had grown up my entire life as that kid. I was running through quadratic equations and college level algebra by the time I was in third grade. Under pressure from damn near everyone around me, I enrolled in university. I knew I didn't want to, don't ask me why I did. I already suffered from issues with bipolar disorder and myriad other issues with my upbringing. Needless to say, I was down, bad. At my worst, I was running through a fifth of Jack and a pack of Marlboro Reds a day. During the lowest of my lows, I like to skate down to the reflection pond. I like to put in an earbud and listen to some music and look up at the stars. The ones I could see anyways, gotta love light pollution. It was one of the few things I could do to calm down. One of these nights, I skated there with my trusty s and in my hoodie's front pocket. I planned on ending my life that night. Well, in the middle of listening to Funkadelic's Maggot Brain, long story short, it's my soul searching song, something rather strange happened. While I was looking up at the stars, one of them seemed far brighter than the others, unusually bright. Within the span of half a second, my music had become white noise and this white light shot towards me. It surrounded me completely. I tried opening and closing my eyes and getting up and walking around, all to no avail. I could hear something trying to speak to me, although I couldn't understand it. Then it was gone. It just left and shot away from me, back into the sky. Upon its departure, I had an overwhelming sense of peace. No more inner turmoil, no more hatred, no more regret, solely peace and acceptance. I skated back to my dorm and fell asleep. This feeling of peace soon eluded me and I was back to my old ways. I'm much better now. Strangely enough, this happened again a few months ago. I was doing limited energy electrical and I was up on top of an extension ladder. I was installing some lighting at an RV resort and there was a decent bit of foot traffic and elderly couples on their golf carts. With my ladder set up on a sidewalk, I made sure to flag it off. After moving it over to work on my fourth fixture, I looked down and saw a man on a golf cart coming towards my ladder and he was by no means going slow. With a golf cart laid and a road available, I'm not sure why he was on the sidewalk. Anyways, I saw him slam into the bottom of my ladder. From 32 feet up, I began to fall. I positioned myself to land properly, 
but I never hit the ground. Inches from the sidewalk, the same white light returned. I was stopped mid-air and had an experience with this mystery light identical to the one years prior. When I came to, I was standing on my own two feet, unharmed. To this day, I have no idea what saved me or why. All I know is that I should be dead or at the very least severely injured right now, but I'm perfectly fine. This event happened back in 2002. I was working for a school as an IT technician and support staff, and it was a working day. I normally get out at 7.30 to be at work before 9. The day before, I didn't do anything unusual before going to bed. But the day after when I woke or tried to wake up was so weird. So I woke up the first time with my alarm. I switched it off, noticed it was 7.30 from the clock in the living room, and went to do the usual morning ritual. Brushing my teeth, toilet, taking off my PJs, and starting to iron my shirts. Then poof, I was back in my bed. The first time I was thinking of a weird deja vu moment, so I got up again, but I noticed it was 7.40 now. I did the same stuff till the ironing parts, and poof, back again in my bed. This time, I was really freaking out, but still doing the same stuff. I noticed again the time passed another 10 minutes, and once again after the ironing, I went straight back into the bed. I remembered I was urging now to get out of this loop. The strange part is, I never tried to do something different, because every time when I woke up, I thought I was out of that loop. I remembered every time I woke up, it felt so real. The sun is shining on my face, it was real for me, until the moment I warped back to my bed. I think this loop happened for 20 or 30 times, and until the last time, it felt like every other time, the final time that I woke up, I did precisely the same things. It was around 11 o'clock and I was late for work, but I got out of this loop. Strange was that the time was correct. The stand of the sun was also changing with every loop. I remembered on the later loops. The sun was shining more brightly on my face when I woke up. It felt like my body was still asleep and my soul was waking up without my body. I noticed everything from my surroundings, the time and the sun. I finally knew I got out of this loop because I finally did more than the ironing. It sure was scary. Around the beginning of May 2016, some friends and I, all 13 or 14 years old at the time, were hanging out together at a birthday party. It was pretty late at night when we decided to watch a movie. The TV we were watching the movie on was super small and high up on a wall, and I remember craning my neck up to look at it while we watched. The movie was also pirated, via a fire stick, so we were subject to a lot of shaky camera work, in addition to the chaos in the movie, fantastic beasts and where to find them. I remember the night vividly. So about halfway through the movie, I had what I can only describe as an out of body experience. I've never had anything like that happen to me before, and I haven't had anything like that happen to me since. I wasn't spiritual at the time, and I still remain agnostic and skeptical of stuff of that nature to this day, but this was so strange, I still can't explain it. I've tried to rationalize it as me just falling asleep, but my friend sitting next to me at the time confirmed I was fully awake that night when I asked him if he saw me pass out or anything following the incident. I asked him about the incident again a few weeks ago, and he still sticks by his story. I remember it freaking us both out. Onto what I actually experienced. I vividly remember this whole thing. I was looking at the TV facing forward. Then my vision went completely sideways. I remember describing it to my friend as like when you die in Minecraft. And then I was suddenly floating above my body like four feet above my body and everyone chilling on the couch. I was floating, watching everything from the top left corner of the room for just a few seconds. I could see myself still looking in the same direction I was looking in before, and I was launched out of my body, so to speak, and then I was back. I remember immediately turning to my friend and going, dude, I think I just astral projected, sort of as a joke. 
But then I started explaining it to him, and we were both starting to freak out a bit. Not in a bad way, in more of a giddy way. Then he started to explain how I looked out of it, like I wasn't paying attention to the movie at all from his perspective. So I definitely didn't fully fall asleep while that whole thing was happening on my end. Seriously, one of the strangest experiences I've ever had in my 18 years of life. My astral projection is still an inside joke between me and the friend who saw me space out. What could this possibly have been?